Hi, I'm Joel McMahon, a pastor at St. Philip Methodist Church in St. Philip, Texas, and uh, we welcome you to our latest podcast. Uh, as we begin, let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we bow before you at this time, we thank you for the goodness that you show to us. We thank you for uh, the Bible and all the things that uh, you reveal of yourself in it, about yourself and about us. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would help us today to uh, learn things that will just help us to walk closer to you and to know you more deeply. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, today I want to start a series on sanctification. It's something that you don't uh, hear a lot about, and yet it's so important. Uh, I would encourage you to read uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 through 8, and I'm just going to lift out one line for time's sake right now, and it is this. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. Now, if it's God's will... That's something that you should want, don't you think? Uh, uh, and yet, people don't even want to talk about it. Even when they know what it means, they don't like it. And yet, it's God's will that we be sanctified. And so, uh, uh, that, and that is uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. Now then, let's look at what sanctification is. Uh, in the dictionary, it says, to sanctify is literally to set apart for special use or purpose. It's figuratively to make holy or sacred. And uh, it comes from the Latin verb sanctificare, which in turn is from sanctus, which means holy, and facere, to make. So to make holy, that's what sanctification means. And the first thing that we need to understand about sanctification is that this is something for believers to uh, try to uh, even enter in or to discuss sanctification. And uh, when you're not saved is uh, just uh, something that's just, just moot. There's no need in bothering. Uh, this is something that is subsequent or after regeneration. Uh, in our scripture today, Paul tells, is writing to a people who are living a life pleasing to God. And that's basically what sanctification is, is living a life that's pleasing to God. And uh, he urges them to do this more and more. And I would just say you continue to do it once you're saved. Uh, he says, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. Sanctification is for people that are more than nominal Christians. It's for Christians who uh, aren't trying to just get by in some way spiritually, but who really want to please God in every way and be the person that he created you to be, and deep inside, you're longing to be. Uh, but sometimes we, we struggle with this. C.S. Lewis uh, said this, and I think it kind of sheds some light on, on our own hearts many times in many ways. He says, when I was a child, I often had a toothache, and I knew that if I went to my mother, she would give me something which would deaden the pain for that night and let me go to sleep. But I did not want to go to my mother, at least not until the pain became very bad. And the reason I did not want to go was this. I did not doubt she would give me the aspirin, but I knew she would also do something else. I knew that she would take me to the dentist the next morning. I could not get what I wanted out of her without getting something more which I did not want. I wanted immediate relief from my pain, but I could not get it without having my teeth set permanently right. And I knew those dentists. 
I knew they would start fiddling about with all sorts of other teeth which had not yet begun to ache. Our Lord is like the dentists. Dozens of people go to him to be cured of some particular sin. Well, he will cure it all right, but he will not stop there. That may be all you asked, but if once you call him in, he will give you the full treatment. And that is just it. We can't do partial things with the Lord. And it's God's will that you be sanctified. First, you have to be saved. Secondly, you have to be willing to surrender your will completely, entirely, wholly to God. Your spirit needs to be as Jesus was in the garden when he prayed, not my will, but yours be done. D.L. Moody said, I firmly believe that the moment our hearts are emptied of pride and selfishness and ambition and everything that is contrary to God's law, the Holy Spirit will fill every corner of our hearts. But if we're full of pride and conceit and ambition and the world, there's no room for the Spirit of God. We must be emptied before we can be filled. Sanctification is a mysterious word to a lot of people. And I know it is a part of the work that God is doing in our lives and that uh, it involves uh, being cleansed from sin. And I like the illustration of sanctification being like a cast iron skillet. And a lot of modern day skillets and frying pans are coated with Teflon, but uh, I always ruin these, forgetting uh, uh, to use the, uh, and, and I wind up using metal utensils or, or burning them up on the stove. But we've always uh, had cast iron skillets in our home, uh, and uh, it's nearly impossible to get uh, food to stick to cast iron. You can, I know, I've done it, but it just works great as long as it's seasoned properly. And uh, my wife and I have learned that you also have to keep it prepared for the next use. We've been doing this kinda, but I just ran across this last night. A properly broken in skillet must be continually prepared for the next occasion it will be used. As soon as the meal is completed and the pan is cooled off, it must be washed. Then it is placed back on the stove and dried with the fire. Then it is wiped down with cooking oil and set aside, ready to use for the next meal. Now my wife and I have been doing this just almost uh, exactly like uh, uh, the people that I read across last night said it should be done, except that my wife always sets the skillet out for at least 24 hours to make sure it's good and dry. And then uh, I have discovered that it's best to not just put it away good and dry, but I'll just take a little Pam, spray a little Pam in there, take a paper towel and just completely cover it with uh, just a thin, 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 or you can't even uh, make a mark in it, uh, just a thin coating of a cooking spray and then put it away and you see then it's ready for use for the next meal. So you might ask how is this like sanctification? Well first of all God must cleanse us from sin. Then he heats us in the crucible of experience and finally he anoints us with his Holy Spirit and we are finally prepared to fully serve him. You see, sanctification is more than being cleansed. It's being cleansed and prepared for God's service. And I think that the process is that first, God breaks our will. Then he purifies and cleanses us. And then he is able to fill us with himself. And until our wills have been broken, he can't use us as he desires. Uh, he can't produce the fruit of the Spirit in our lives as he wants to. And maybe this explains why some Christians always seem to produce the wrong fruit in their lives. 
God is still not completely in control. Maybe occasionally, maybe even most of the time, but we're not what God wants us to be until we are entirely surrendered to him. I spoke last week to our congregation about how uh, we uh, may have invited Jesus into our lives, but it's like we've uh, put him in the passenger seat uh, of the car of our lives. And we want to hang on to the steering wheel. We want Jesus for our co-pilot, but we don't want him to be the driver. We don't want him to be the director. He don't, we don't want him to be the one who is in control of where we go. And uh, this is just it. As long as there's one section that's not uh, submitted to his will, there's going to be problems. So uh, I encourage you, if you haven't done it yet, go ahead and just move over and say, here, Jesus, you take the steering wheel now. I want to go where you want me to go. I want to live the life that you want me to live. But uh, this is just it. And you see, this is something that's going to come up over and over in our lives. And this is something I'm going to continue to talk about in uh, future uh, podcasts like this one about sanctification. You remember the story of the rich young ruler? He went up to Jesus. In fact, in one uh, gospel, it says he ran up to Jesus and said, Master, what must I do to have eternal life? And it says that Jesus looked at him and he loved him. And he said, there's just one thing that you lack. Just go and sell everything that you have and give it to the poor and then come follow me. And it said that the young man went away sorrowful. Now, it doesn't say that he never came back. It says he went away sorrowful. And Jesus did say how hard it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. He said it's easier for, the, for a, a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. And uh, there's all sorts of reasons for that. But then he goes on and they say, well, then who can get into heaven? And he said, what's impossible with God or what's impossible with man is possible with God. There's evidence that this rich young ruler did come back, that he did sell everything, and then he was a follower of Jesus. But you see, Jesus does this with us all the time. Uh, we start following him and we think we have everything right with him. And then all of a sudden, something is presented to us. And it's something that the Lord says to us is that one thing that we lack. We were fine up till he showed us this. And now we have something we have to wrestle with. And until we say, okay, Lord, and obey, we're not going to be able to really move on with him. That's what we're going to be talking about a little bit later on. But right now, I just want to cover it by saying uh, that God wants us entirely surrendered to him. Paul Harvey, uh, he, uh, a few years back, wrote in Guidepost magazine about his baptism. He said that even though he had received almost every reward for his broadcasting powers and ability, he still felt empty inside. And then one summer, he and his wife were vacationing in a place called Cave Creek, Arizona. And Sunday morning came and they decided to go to church. And so they went to this little church where there were only like 12 other people present, but there was a really good sense of the presence of of God's Holy Spirit in this place. And for some reason, he began thinking about John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And he said, I liked that everlasting life part, and I believed in Jesus but I'd never gone forward at a church service. 
I remembered one night praying in my hotel room and asking Jesus to come into my heart, but I felt that there was still something that was missing. He said, to the, he said that the preacher got up and announced that his sermon was going to be about baptism. And at that point, Paul Harvey says, I yawned. But as soon as he started talking about it, I found myself interested. He talked about the symbolism behind it and how it symbolized the complete surrender of one's life to Christ and how there was nothing really magic in the water, but there was this cleansing inside that took place when you yielded yourself to Jesus. Finally, when he came to the end of his sermon, he said, if any of you have not been baptized in this way, I invite you to come forward and join me here at the pulpit. And Paul Harvey says, to my surprise, I found myself going forward. The preacher had said there was nothing magic in the water. And yet, as I descended into the depths and rose again, I knew something life-changing had happened. A cleansing inside and out. No longer did there seem to be two uncertain, contradictory Paul Harveys, just one immensely happy one. I felt the fulfilling surge of the Holy Spirit in my life. Paul went on, the change this simple act made in my life is so immense as to be indescribable. Since totally yielding to him in that act of baptism, my heart can't stop singing. Also, perhaps because baptism is such a public act and because one's dignity gets as drenched as one's body, I discovered a new unselfconsciousness in talking about my beliefs. He closed with these words. The other evening, when on a speaking trip, I was flying over West Texas and looking at the beautiful sunset. My heart swelled with joy in my new surrender, and I thought, how wonderful. We have all this and heaven, too. I think that Paul Harvey experienced what is really called entire sanctification. Even when you're saved, you know there's something missing and you don't have complete victory until you're willing to humble yourself, body and soul, and surrender completely to God. Oh, you're not perfect, it's just the start, but now instead of your will being uh, in competition with God's will, the battle's over. You have surrendered. There's no competition anymore, and the result of the act of sanctification is a holy heart. You may make mistakes and do the wrong thing occasionally. You may say the wrong thing at times, but your heart's intent is only for good. It is pure. It is holy. Now, the last thing I'll say about this experience, and it is an experience. It's not just a theory. It's something that you experience in life. And what this I'd like to say is that it is, it is preceded by entire consecration. In other words, you have to surrender every bit of your selfish will, your past, your present, and your future to God. You lay yourself figuratively on God's altar and sacrifice everything to him. Let him crush your will. Let him killed the old man or old woman of sin. Let him purify you and cleanse you. And when he does, a new you will emerge. A new you that is given fully to God. A new you that desires God's will in every part of your life. Obedience isn't a problem anymore. It's a joy because it's going to please your Heavenly Father. Producing the fruit of the Spirit isn't difficult. It is a natural result of the Spirit being in control. And your life will take on a new love, 
a new joy, a new peace that you never imagined. I think I could sum this all up with a story. And it's uh, the story of a little girl who was walking with her grandfather in the garden. The grandfather was out there just checking things out. And the little girl was just walking along, just jabbering lovingly and uh, and, 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 and uh, just really attentively to her grandfather. She was asking about his childhood and about uh, how he met his wife and, and all these questions, just one qu just trying to know her grandfather. And, uh, and he was trying to pay attention to the garden. So finally, out of desperation, he pulled a $10 bill out of his pocket and he said, uh, why don't you take this $10 bill and go find your mom and y'all go buy you a toy. And she looked at the $10 bill and she looked at him and she put her little hands on her little hips and she squinched her little face and she said, Grandpa, I don't want your money. I want you. I hope that you will hear today your Heavenly Father saying to you, I don't want things that you want to give me. I don't want just one thing that I want you to do for me. What I want is you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.